Hi there. Um, regular watchers and listeners uh, will be familiar with Palmy's expertise in all things to do with technology, specifically AI. And, um, and, and that's the topic we will be discussing today. Uh, we'll be talking about Parmi's blockbuster column from last week, which tells this amazing um, origin story, I think we can call it, uh, of AI involving Google and a group of uh, really smart people and opportunities missed and lost. But before we get yeah. to that, there was this big news over the weekend, slight detour here, uh, involving sure. AI and and Hollywood and and the Hollywood Hollywood actors who have joined the like have raised a, a new concern about studios capturing their image and then possibly using them in ways that uh, the actors themselves may or may not approve. Unpack that for us a little bit, Parmi. What what exactly is the potential concern? So the concern came out last Friday when a member of the SAG-AFRA union, which is a union for actors in Hollywood, said that they had been given a proposal by the studios that actors could be uh, able to license their likeness to a studio with, uh, they would be paid one day's wage. Uh, and uh, when they're scanned, then the studio can then use that actor's image um, in a film, generate it. They didn't go into detail about how it could be used, but it could be used in perpetuity forever. Um, and of course, you can imagine $100 isn't a lot of money, maybe for one day for some people that that's enough. Um, but, uh, you know, that takes away a lot of potential opportunities for background actors because if that just continues to be used well that's work that a real life human being could be done could be doing instead so i think there's a lot of concern that technology has got to a point and literally just within the last year uh, we have had this explosion of so-called generative ai technology where ai models don't just learn but they create so they can create images they can create videos um, clones of people, digital avatars, um, and there's a lot of concern about that technology being employed in films. Mm. Um, now that has been done already to some extent. We've seen de-aging of actors like Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones and Carrie Fisher in Star Wars. Um, but I think the real concern isn't so much about that, but more just people being replaced. And it's not going to start with the with the movie stars. It's going to start with the background actors, because yeah. these are the people who you might not notice it as much. And I think an interesting thing is this has already been going on. If you think about it for the last few years. So I spoke to actually I actually spoke to a couple of background actors on Friday who said that they had tweeted about this, which is how I kind of found them. But they had been scanned during the filming of a couple of recent movies. One was Creed three. And they were asked to go into this trailer where there was a rig with cameras set up and they had to stand there with their arms outstretched and be scanned for three minutes. And it was they were told that it was to fill out crowd scenes. Um, and but then they were never paid for that and they were never told what would happen to their images. Um, and this is hundreds of people who had their images scanned and which could now be in a database somewhere, um, either to be used for another crowd scene or very plausibly used to train an AI model to generate synthesized versions of background actors. So mm. the question I think is really just as the AI gets the zoom in more and more to the people in the background, you know, the, we'll have a question like, are those people actually real? In the same way we question whether the scenery in a, in a Marvel movie, is that real or is that yeah. CGI um, generated? Yeah, so you won't even need green screen. You can just simply populate the or or a clip with people and and as you point out this is not a concern for Harrison Ford uh, or Leo DiCaprio because they are the big stars and they have leverage and they have the ability to say no if they wanted to or at least uh, if they were put through the same sort of situation they could demand uh, greater uh, payment from the studios make arrangements that every time the studio uses said image they they uh, but but background mm -hmm. actors who don't have that kind of leverage are the ones that, no. that are more vulnerable. Um, yeah. And studios, Hollywood, 
you know, there's a long history of being exploited. Absolutely. And I mean, if you just think about the rise of CGI in films over the last 20 years, you know, a big reason for that is uh, instead of using you know, puppetry or special effects that are more physical, um, it's just cheaper to use CGI ultimately and easier um, because a lot of the staff who were making special effects in the past were unionized. Um, and so also studios would feel like, well, a lot of the um, expenditure they're going to use on CGI gets paid up front. Um, whereas if it's kind of human done, there's kind of a lot of different uh, potential unknown factors and what they'd have to pay. So, it, it, I mean, you can argue that the, um, the expenses are similar, but it was very much a financial decision by movie studios to move to do more CGI. And I could totally see that happening more with with background actors. But this is a totally different ball game because replacing, you know, buildings and cars and uniforms with digital graphics is one thing. Replacing people, you're literally taking a wage out of someone's pocket. Um, and that also, I think, adds a little, I don't know, I, personally, I don't know what you think, Bobby, but I, I think when I see movies that have a lot more CGI, where it's excessive, where it's almost gratuitous, it, it feels kind of empty, it feels kind of soulless. And I could see movies increasingly going in that direction, especially if they start replacing people. Yeah, I agree. I, and, and I am curious, curious and it, it, there is a certain, uh, what's the right word, reassurance to know that the background mm -hmm. uh, actors in a scene, even if they're not actually participating in the in the dialogue or in the, in the narrative of the story, there's something reassuring to know, in knowing that those are real human beings and not just mm. you know, uh, an artist's impression of a human being. It's one thing to go and see a, a, a um, film, that's different. But when people are, are purporting to be human beings and are not, that I would worry about. Um, yeah, it just adds a sense of, uh, it, it makes a scene come alive. It, it creates yeah. a sense of immersion and realness when you're watching a film. I think I, I agree yeah. with that completely. Yeah. Okay, so now with the breaking news out of the way, let's let's clear the table for this amazing piece you wrote last week. Oh, thank um, you. And it's, it's, it's really, I recommend all of us and watchers go to after this conversation, to go to uh, Bloomberg.com slash opinion, look for Palmy Olson's piece about uh, th this particular story. So it's the year is 2017 in Mountain Valley. A group of Google uh, scientists get together and create what now we call the T in chat GPT. But That's right. Google does nothing with it. So tell, tell us the story in, in brief about how this came. That was such a great summary, pretty much, of how great it was and what a problem that came afterwards. But yeah, essentially, you know, there were these uh, a couple of AI researchers at Google in 2017. They were having lunch with one another and they were discussing ways to try and make um, this application of deep learning for translation, translating language on Google Translate better. Because I don't know if you remember Google Translate back in 2016, mm -hmm. 2017, it was actually pretty clunky. It was pretty yeah. terrible, um, especially for languages that were not Latin based. So, yeah. you know, Chinese to Russian, like those were just really awful, um, made a lot of mistakes. Um, and so these guys were kind of thinking, how can we improve the way that the machine learning system actually translates words? That's what they were focusing on. Um, what ended up coming out of their invention, and it really was an invention, um, was something that could do much, much more than translate languages. But what they initially wanted to do was just make a better translator. And without going into too much technical detail, um, they wanted to change the way an AI model looks at words. And until then, the way it worked was that it would look at words in a sentence in sequence. Um, and what they realized was that the kind of technology that was already available in chips meant that an AI model could actually look at a sentence or a big block of text all at once. Um, so this was taking advantage of all the different processing power that was available in AI chips at the time. So if you think about the chip that's in your computer at home, the CPU in your computer or the brain, it's probably got about four cores, which are kind of like the heart of the, of the chip. 
um, yeah. that kind of coordinate all the, the processing that goes on. In an AI chip that goes into a server, which is the kind of technology that Google was using at the time, there's thousands of these cores and they can process information in parallel. What these scientists essentially realized was they could totally exploit that um, and use it to make uh, this AI model pay attention to all the key parts in text, understand the context, mm. uh, and then just translate it better. Yeah. Um, and so they spent the next five months kind of discussing the idea, pulling in other people from other parts of Google. So some came from Google Brain, some were from Google Research. Um, and they, you know, it wasn't easy. There's always a lot of dead ends in, in science and in research. Yeah. Um, and I remember one of them was saying that they were, you know, writing a lot of their hypothesis on the whiteboard and people were coming, coming up to it and saying, no, that's not going to work. And they were also another big thing that they faced that was challenging was the culture at Google itself, which was very, um, one, bureaucratic and two, um, comfortable because Google was already using cutting edge technology at the, at the time, recurrent neural networks. That was yeah. the way to do things. And there was a sense that they were already on the cutting edge. So why do anything different? So it really took a special group of people one of them who was already planning to leave, another guy whose kind of view on science was, if it ain't, bro if it ain't broke, break it. Yeah. He didn't like to kind of go with the status quo. So it was people like that. And they decided to just kind of rewrite the fundamentals of how these AI models looked at text and language. And what they came up with was what they called a transformer. Um, it's essentially a kind of neural network art that can translate text and translate other types of data um, to generate new data. Uh, and they pulled together over the next five months their research and they wrote a paper. And the name of the paper is called Attention is All You Need um, because it was about this concept of attention, not in the way we think of attention. It's a very yeah. nerdy computer science <laughs> uh, definition of attention. Yes. Um, and uh, ever since, you know, it, it's become the most cited or one of the most cited AI research papers in history. It's been cited 80,000 times and uh, it's been used by pretty much all the big AI models that we see today, whether it's Dolly, the image generating um, system, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, um, ChatGPT, of course, all the big language models use the transformer. It's a big part of how these systems work. Um, and one of them, one of the scientists was telling me that just before they, they, um, just before they submitted the paper, someone came up to them and said, is this just going to be useful for translation? And he was realizing then, no, it's not. This is actually going to be much bigger than that. And, and of course, the, the thing is that, you know, as you say, everybody now in the space uses it, uh, but a long time, Google, to its credit, shared it, open you know, tech companies do that all the time. That's uh, right. And other people began to use it and, and uh, after a fashion, monetize it, or, or certainly uh -huh. use it to create uh, core products. But Google didn't. And sort of, uh, it, it sort of went under the radar. Now you, please, Google has, you know, 140,000 employees of whom which 7,133 people are working in AI. So you got to think mm -hmm. there are millions or, well, anyway, thousands of ideas floating around at Google that don't catch the attention of higher ups or don't get uh, actualized or operational. But this is a big one to miss. Yeah. I think they, they, I think they did kind of internally deepen the innards of Google's uh, staff understand that this was important, but mm. there was just so much inertia in this company by virtue of how big it was. And this is like the big paradox of big yeah. tech. And it's the same. I've heard, I've heard the exact same problem at Facebook. There were some really great research that's happened at Facebook, you know, five, 10 years ago. And it just that that company has also struggled to execute on the research that comes out of it, AI teams or whatever kind of teams that are that are there. Um, and it's just all these different layers of management, the, the many different people that require sign off before you can push something through. And there's also this kind of mind, this kind of 
weird kind of narcissistic academic mindset in among a lot of the researchers that I've heard of, um, where there's actually so much um, worry and time spent on whose name is on what paper and getting to a conference in time, getting it published in time, um, rather than creating something that could actually um, make an impact. Of course, there are many people in these companies who do want to do that, but this is just really a, Google in a way is a victim of its own success. It's so big it just becomes so much harder to be nimble and to execute on all the different ideas that are bubbling up. It's incredibly talented research base. And this is something I've heard time and time again from people who've worked there is an incredible sense of frustration that they couldn't see their ideas being shipped. That's the term they use. It, it mm. doesn't get shipped into, into production. Um, and so, you know, there was eight people who worked on this transformer uh, whose name was on the, the paper and every single one of them left Google. Like none of them saw a long-term future at this company. Um, and nearly all of them started their own companies. I mean, I think that's also just a signal of their own ambition and the fact mm. that the prestige that came with building this, especially now, um, yeah. has afforded them an incredible amount of, of value as well for whatever business they build. I tallied up the valuations of all their businesses that came up to more than $4 billion, just the startups that these people have worked on. Um, but, you know, a big reason for why those valuations are so high is because of open AI. It's not really because of yeah. something Google's done. It's yeah. just because of the incredible hype that's been generated by a competing company to Google. Yeah. And I think that's very interesting. The fact that individuals, even if Google wasn't able to fully capitalize this at, the mo at in that moment, the individuals behind the idea were, after a fashion, able to capitalize on on the on their idea um mm -hmm. it's sort of you know i'm going to date myself here but you know throughout the history of big corporations and corporations in the technology space there have always been stories like this of great ideas being generated somewhere down in the bowels of the of the laboratories and then mm -hmm. not really being uh, turned into uh, into gold uh the one i'm thinking of at the top of my head is when when CDs first came out, you know, compact discs, mm -hmm. uh, I have a suspicion that many of our listeners have no idea what I'm talking about. But when <laughs> compact discs first came out, they were invented by a company called Philips, the Dutch company. Yeah. Um, Philips invented it, but didn't know how to market it properly. And the Japanese company, yeah. Sony in particular, jumped on it and made billions and billions of dollars. And Philips was, did put out its own product, but it was an, also ran at best. Um, mm. but, the, but the engineers at Philips who, who designed the CD and made it possible, the inventors, if you like, didn't get a chance, I think, to cash out in the way that these eight people, oh, seven guys and a woman. Really? Yeah. So I, I think that's the big difference with technology companies now, that there is, a, there is an ecosystem, particularly in, in Silicon Valley, where individuals, even within these giant companies, individuals can, if the ducks line up just right, can cash in on the on the on the value of their intellect. Hundred percent, and you know we're seeing that even more broadly just in the last um, eight months because what ChatGPT kicked off wasn't just excitement about how people could use this technology, but absolutely this kind of race among people to start their own companies because they so many of them are finding themselves kind of hamstrung by what they can do in the bigger tech companies. Mm. Um, and so, I've, I mean, I've been hearing as well, I mean, it's not just this group of eight people, but many people have been leaving DeepMind, for example, Google yes. DeepMind, Google Brain, um, DeepMind and Google Brain have now merged, but both units have been le losing talent in the last, um, in the last six to eight months. Um, and Microsoft, companies like that, uh, and they're moving to start companies because mm. if you, or even people have been leaving OpenAI, because imagine if you are an engineer at OpenAI and you go to some venture capitalists and you say, I'm going to start a startup, I've come from OpenAI, they're going to say, take my money because, mm. I mean, yeah. the prestige that comes from working there, it really counts for a lot, especially because OpenAI is so small. I mean, I think they have something like a staff of about 450, but in terms of the actual number of AI researchers at OpenAI, I think it's something in the hundreds. It's something like mm. 150, something like that. Like compare that to the 7,000 figure Google, that yeah. you mentioned. It's just so tiny. It's such a concentrated number of really, really um, good people, smart people. Um, I mean, I was talking to a startup founder 
in San Francisco just the other week. And he started his company, I want to say about five months ago. And within months of starting it, one of his own staff was asking about when he should go and start his own company. So there's this kind of um, flywheel effect where everybody almost feels like they want to get in on the action somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are trillions of dollars out there looking for people like this to to, to invest in. Um, so let's circle to what happened to Google and AI. You know, ChatGPT came out, OpenAI went first. And then everyone else's, the big uh, tech companies have been scrambling to try and, and catch up, uh, get the same kind of attention that OpenAI has got through ChatGPT. Where is Google's, where are uh, Google's effort in the AI space? Where is it now? So as, basically as a result of uh, being caught on the back foot by ChatGPT, Google has introduced BARD, um, yeah. and it is, uh, I think it's probably going to go, I, mean, I don't know what to, to what extent it's going to follow Microsoft in trying to sell AI services to its enterprise clients through Google Cloud, but right mm -hmm. now it's it's it seems very consumer focused. BARD is very much a consumer tool, yeah. and Google has marketed that as a search companion. So uh, I'm sure you, you've tried it. Um, it's a bit like Bing. It's very similar to ChatGPT, but it's based on Google's own proprietary language model called Lambda, um, which, by the way, uh, just as another example of kind of how slow Google has been to this, Lambda was being worked on in 2020. People were mm. testing Lambda, uh, and there's another version called um, Palm. So it, it had a, a large language model that was almost as good as what ChatGPT and what, sorry, OpenAI ended up releasing in November 2022. But Google, you know, one and a half, two years earlier, kind of was already at that level, but it just wasn't pulling the trigger. Now, I'm a little personally a little bit torn on how I feel about that as a kind of columnist and someone who's meant to have views on these things, because on the one hand, releasing this kind of technology to the public has risks. Um, to jobs, uh, the spread of misinformation, misuse. Um, so you could say maybe it's good that Google was quite slow to release this. Um, but I don't think it's just about, I don't think Google's motivation was just to be cautious. Mm. I think the company genuinely just suffers from inertia. Um, and now that it's rushing out the same technology, um, I think we have to be very wary of what ends up being put out to the public and uh, how safe and what kind of safeguards these uh, these tools have, particularly when it comes to bias and misinformation. Exactly. And and um, in the interest of full disclosure, I should point out, we both, Parmi and I work for Bloomberg. Bloomberg has its own um, sort of artificial intelligence ambitions and, and generative AI uh, product um, and service. But uh, to come back, I think for one very interesting point, it's it's not just, you know, all big companies have a level of inertia. We, we know this. Um, but there's something even more specific when it comes to the big tech companies in Silicon Valley, which they're already on the cutting edge. They're already on the cutting edge. Why go farther? Right? It's not like they're mm. in, a, in a certain way that is circa... Uh, 2015 and they don't want to change uh, from that. They're just resistant to the idea of change for its own sake. But in their minds and in, in many cases in reality, they are actually on the cutting edge. It's a question of choice of how far out you want to go. It's not like you're lacking for innovation, but just how much innovation you want to risk, right? So, um, you know, how much innovation you want to risk at the expense of your shareholders because yeah. Google and Meta, they are obliged to, you know, they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to maintain a certain level of growth and profit. And that is why both companies are addicted to advertising and to the advertising model. Meta makes 99% of its revenue from advertising. Google makes a similarly large amount, not as much, I think it's about 80% of its revenue comes from ads. And so another reason why it has really never on its own volition up until OpenAI came along with ChatGPT, tried to put a language model into its search bar 
because that could seriously cannibalize its own search results. Why do people want to click around on Google search results if they can just get the answer from a chat bot? Mm. So, yes, yeah, so I think there's the inertia of being big, but as you rightly point out, there, there are other things at play and a, a big one is just, uh, you know, where they make their money and mm. the bigger they get the more risk averse they have to become in order to protect those profits and to protect that business model. Yeah, you don't want to disrupt your your business model. Now, in in, in writing this speech to Google to ask them about uh, the make of this, this episode, is there a sense okay. of regret at Google so, uh, about having the one that got away? Or, or I mean, can a company like that even admit such a thing? The only sense I got that... Uh, that there was regret was, I was actually surprised to see this, was the uh, spokesperson used the word bittersweet. So mm. they said, um, they gave me a statement that Google was proud of our industry defining breakthrough work on transformers. Um, we're energized by the AI ecosystem it's created. Oh yeah, definitely energized. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and they and they say including they're you know happy for the um, bittersweet opportunities for our researchers to continue to advance their work outside of Google. So I think that uh, that speaks a little bit to the they're admitting they're like yes every single one of them have left us, um, mm. and that's not great for us. Um, but they're trying to put a positive spin on it because, of course, they are jumping into this race, too. And it has certainly forced them to move a lot faster than they did before. And there are 7,133 other uh, AI experts where those came from. Uh, I, I wonder if, if a company like Google, having learned from this experience, can figure out how to better create an atmosphere where these ideas are not it then can surface and to the good of both Google and its its clients and i think that's absolutely yeah. very hard it's a very hard thing to do because as the one of the researchers said you know they had to go against what was already seen as cutting edge they had to be willing mm. to break that so now google and any other company that's working on this has to be willing to break the transformer and find something that's even better even though we're yeah. talking right now about how amazing the transformer is that doesn't mean it's the last step in the road there's always going to be mm. something better I like that. I, I like that. I should put that on uh, uh, on my on a business card. You know. If it ain't broken, <laughs> break it. Uh, yeah. But speaking like of somebody, somebody who who revels in doing exactly that, is about to jump into the uh, AI space too. Your your uh, most recent column uh, was about Elon Musk and what he's calling X AI. What's that about? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, X is a really important part in yeah. Elon's uh, career, and he's yes. used that um, that figure a lot, that letter a lot in his um, in, in his businesses. But he wanted, has wanted to uh, start an AI company for a few months. He's talked about it. He's talked in interviews about creating a kind of alternative, truth-based version of ChatGPT. I mean, just very, very briefly, it's essentially a sort of anti-woke ChatGPT, something that is not constrained by and sort of content moderation or um, limits on you know saying offensive things what that's going to mean in practice i really have no idea but um, last week he put up a web page that showed about a dozen um you know ai researchers from places like google open ai um, microsoft who were working with him to understand the nature of the universe or answer the questions of the universe um, which sounds incredibly abstract. It sounds like he's been on a magic mushroom mm. journey or something. But, um, you know, actually, the idea is not that crazy because if you look at the Twitter profile for Demis Hassabis, mm. rather, who is the um, co-founder and CEO of DeepMind, he is also trying to do the same thing. I don't know if you're looking that up right now. <laughs> because yes, I, I think his... Did, did you yeah. find it? No, not yet. Go ahead. I think, I, I'll oh, okay. I, 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 I'll have to look it up. But I, th I think it says something like, you know, he's trying to build AGI, which is a super mm. intelligence. And right. he wants to do this in order to unlock, uh, understand the true nature of reality. So a lot of these abstract ideas are actually not that unusual in tech circles, particularly in AI circles and in Silicon Valley, because this idea of building a super intelligence, um, there's this sense... If you do that, if you unlock the secrets of the universe and reality, you'll also figure out how to solve some of our deepest human 
problems, uh, whether it's diseases or poverty or climate change. Um, so there's this kind of meta idea that you can solve all those things at the same time. But why these guys gravitate towards talking about solving and understanding the universe, I'm still not entirely sure. I blame Doug, Douglas Adams and Hitchhiker's Guide to the uh, <laughs> Uh, but, the, you know, we did get the answer in that book, the, 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 the answer to the question and everything is 42. Is 42, but yes. I think when Elon announced XAI, his new AI company, if you actually look at the date, the numbers of the date add up to 42. Yeah. <laughs> which is very Elon Musk. <laughs> that is, that is just so perfect. Um, uh -huh. Anyway. Uh, and a perfect place to end uh, this conversation. For, there'll be many more like this, I'm sure, uh, about AI uh, in the in the months of, uh, months ahead. Parmi, thanks again for joining me. Uh, My today pleasure. From thanks, Bobby. Uh, thank thank you, you to all those of us, all those of who have been listening and and uh, look and uh, watching us. Uh, please go to Bloomberg.com. Opinion. Look for Parmi Olson and read not just these two columns that I've cited in this conversation, but everything uh, she writes about AI and plenty of other areas. Um, there's nothing but great reading there. Um, and also, more generally, uh, it's all around the world covering a wide range of topics. Thank you for joining us and see you next week. Goodbye.